Thank you for joining us. I'm Peter Bergen, uh, Vice President at New America, and I'm also on the advisory council of the Foley Foundation, the president of which is Diane Foley, who is here with us today to talk about her new book, American Mother, uh, which she uh, she wrote co-wrote with Colin McCann, who's uh, also joining us today, who's a, a well-known novelist. He will be uh, joining us uh, in, in a minute. Uh, we're going to get started with Diane. Um, and Diane, uh, maybe you could start and tell us you know, why you decided to, to write this book and, and why now. Thank you, Peter. It's such an honor to be here today. Um, I've been wanting to write this book um, ever since um, Jim was killed, to be honest, um, particularly um, as we uh, started the Foley Foundation and we're trying to raise awareness about the problem of um, the taking of innocent Americans around the world. So we really, um, I really wanted just so Americans could understand the threat that is involved. And, um, but I really needed a talented storyteller like Colin McCann to make it happen. Um, and Benjamin Gray, could you, um... I think you're you're visible to your your camera's visible if you could just jump off because I, I know Colin will be joining us at some point. Um and Diane, um so uh, you know, for those for those of by the way, for anybody who wants to, to buy the book, uh they you can purchase the book uh, by looking at the bottom of the screen and pushing on the purchase button. And for anybody who wants to ask Diane or Colin McCann a question. Slido box is uh, will have uh, the ability to to take your questions and then I'll moderate those questions. So, um, Dan, your where where do you begin the book and and how what's the pro, what's the progress of the the the, the book as it, as you write it? We particularly um, realize when um, Alexander Cody, the British jihadist, offered to speak with victims, we thought, Colin McCann particularly thought that was a good way to introduce the story because Jim was murdered a good nearly 10 years ago. It'll be this August. And we realized that for some people, they may have forgotten what happened and how it happened. And we wanted um, people to help understand that. So um, in October of 2021, um, I had the opportunity to speak with Alexander Cody um, for two days. And then again, during the trial in 2022. So that seemed to be a good way to um, start the story. And here is my friend, Colin McCann. I'm, I'm, Hi, Colin. I'm, welcome. Apologize so deeply for all this. Uh, so it feels like we're living in a construction site, and and uh, I think it'll it it it'll 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 go uh, in in just a moment. But um, I, I apologies for 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 the noise if it's coming through. No, no noise coming through. Um. So, Colm, you're you're a a well known novelist. How how did it come about that? Uh, I mean, if you could, if you and Diane could sort of set the stage a bit for people who haven't read the book yet. Um, how did it come about that you and Diane uh, started writing this book? What are the big themes and stories in the book? Uh, and what do you hope readers will take away from the book? Well, I think it's one of the most extraordinary uh, uh, human stories that uh, that I have come upon um, uh, in the course of my career. I've done a lot of things in my career, but this particular uh, moment was uh, truly extraordinary uh, for me. To watch Diane as she went in and she sat in not four feet from her son's killer, when they talked, the things that they talked about, to, to be witness to that, but then also to be witness to Diane's life and the changes that she has brought about um, in terms of um, hostages and uh, and hostage policy um, around, around the world and especially in the United States has been, um, for me, been an incredible education as a novelist, as a writer, as a citizen um, of, of, of this country. It's been um, 
one of the great privileges of my time to spend, um, you know, uh, dwelling in this particular story. And Diane had mentioned uh, his name is his last name is Cody. And I mean, who who is he and, and what role did he play? So Alexander Cody was one of the uh, British jihadists that uh, uh, became known as the Beatles. Um, and uh, he was um, uh, ar arrested eventually in uh, in Syria, brought back uh, to the United States, stripped of his British citizenship. And um, he became um, uh, he, he pleaded guilty to um, counts of um, terrorism and conspiracy to murder um, and um so he was one of the the, the notorious um killers um who uh you know became part of that iconic uh photograph that um that people around the world got to see um all, uh, in 2014 i remember myself seeing that photograph and thinking um oh my the world was changed uh, in in that particular moment um and then to 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 witness the ongoing of of of, of history, to be part of this story, to see Diane um, engage with him, and uh, was uh, to me uh, a, a real lesson in 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 humility and 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 grace and candor and charm, um, but also the power of a, of a, a woman uh, who refused to give up. Um, and there was a great deal of perseverance, stamina and courage that it took for Diane to do all the things that she has done uh, to change the whole landscape of this, um, you know, this current political situation. Uh, to be witness to that was um, was a, a great thing for me as a writer. How did you come to um, how did you come to write this book together? Mm hmm. Well, it was interesting because we were total strangers. And uh, yet, apparently, after Jim was murdered, um, someone had sent, sent Colm a story of our son Jim reading one of Colm's novels, Let the Great World Spin. And they'd send it to Colm shortly after Jim's horrific videos and photos of his murder. And I think it piqued Colm's curiosity. And he tells me he reached out to me, but in the horror of that time, I never received his message. So it was really um, three years ago through a friend at Marquette University, we met on a Zoom call um, of a book club studying Colm's novel, A Paragon. And it was there that I had the pleasure of meeting Colm. And the thing was that, 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 that um, you know, um, I had a chance to chat with Diane then, and um, we we talked, and and she told me that she hadn't had a chance to um, to tell her story, and I knew that her story was incredibly uh, important to um, to the world, and I just went up to to um, to 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 be with her and and her husband John, and spent a couple of days up there, and um, began increasingly to know that this story was one that had to be told. Um, and um, I, you know, originally I was just going to try to be a kind of story whisperer, um, so that she would do, do it um, herself. And then increasingly, I began to see that both of us together, uh, as a team, could bring this book, um, you know, in, into life. And so it's framed in, in 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 the third person with the meetings with Alexander Cody when we go down to to Virginia together. It's, it's bookended by these meet, meetings. But then in the middle, Diane tells her story, and she tells it with such honesty and 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 and, and grace. Um, I, I think it's really extraordinary. It's a lot about faith. Um, uh, it's a lot about uh, you know uh, that desire to change um things and, and not to wallow um in uh, the difficulties that that, that 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 have come about but to force a change when she knew it, it, something had to happen and and what's interesting to me is that um well she is extraordinary but she's also very ordinary i mean diane is a nurse practitioner um, you know, she came from New Hampshire. She was living in the suburbs, but she decided to take all the things that she knew and knock on every door and 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 you know hit every email button and 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 ask people to change because the policy needed 
to be changed. What was happening was that um, nobody was um, was 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 getting out, and and um, since Diane. Uh, since Jim's death, over a hundred um, innocent Americans, right, Diane, um, right. have been have which been is returned. amazing. You know, it. Jim challenged me um, as an American. I felt very challenged. I knew our country could do better, Peter, and I didn't know how though. <laughs> but I knew that together with other good people, um, we had to do better. So that's how the Foley Foundation started, really. Yeah, and Diane, describe. Um, then, you know, the situation when Jim was taken and also um, Stephen Sotloff and Kyla Mueller and Peter Kasig and, and, and others, other Americans who were also taken by ISIS. What was the situation like in terms of the way the U.S. government dealt with um, Americans being kidnapped by ISIS? Um, and how has it changed since then? And I mean, I think it's fair to say that you played an instrumental role in in that change, um, you know, along with um, other other families like the Levinson family, whose father was, uh, you know, disappeared in Iran and died in captivity. Uh, but there are, there have been changes. I mean, 2014 is a decade ago. The situation today, uh, the way the U.S. government handles these things, is very different. So perhaps you could explain how the situation was handled a decade ago and how is it handled today, whether it's somebody taken by a terrorist group or somebody taken by a foreign government like Brittany Griner on sort of dubious or slightly trumped up charges. Absolutely. In 2012, um, our country had absolutely no one who was accountable for any innocent U.S. national who was taken hostage or wrongfully detained abroad. We had absolutely no one who was accountable. It was handled on a very ad hoc basis, depending on how the administration felt about it. But the general theme was that, particularly if, a, if an America was taken by a terrorist, that our country felt strongly that we would not negotiate with terrorists. And that's what President Obama went up, went along with at that moment in time. Um, and that um, idea of not negotiating with terrorism, with terrorists rather, was not evidence-based. Um, and if anything, the, the research showed that if countries refused to negotiate, those citizens would in fact be killed. And that's exactly what happened to the British and the Americans, whereas all the European hostages were negotiated out by their countries. Um, and I really feel it took the horrific murder of all those Americans, um, both um, Jim, Peter, Kayla, um, and Stephen, as well as Luke Summers, Warren Weinstein, Robert Levinson, all of those Americans were killed while in captivity in that time frame, and it this is their legacy that um, I really feel all of us felt that our country had to do better. We had to find a way to free innocent Americans who were targeted simply for being Americans, while at the same time figure out how to deter the horror of international hostage taking. And I mean the U.S policy on no negotiations, which essentially means no ransom payments. I mean, it has, hasn't changed, but what has changed? What is new? Well, what has changed is in um, 2015, President Obama ordered an all of review of particularly the government and non-government um, hostage policy, if you will. And in June of 2015, issued a directive that set up our U.S. hostage enterprise. So now we have an interagency fusion cell to deal with criminal or terrorist kidnappings, uh, State Department um, office, presidential envoy for hostage affairs, and at the White House. We have a hostage response group that um, 
deals with whatever strategies the fusion cell and special envoy can come up with to try to use shrewd diplomacy to negotiate the freedom of these American citizens. And if I may, I mean, it also feels, Peter, that, it, that there's a change in the air, um, you know, and a, a, a general change in, in the national mood and a shift. Um, and that has a lot to do with people um, deciding that it is it's time to 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 uh, look at things differently. Now, these two two men who got um, uh, uh, who were part of the Beatles, they weren't shipped off to Guantanamo. They weren't taken to Abu Ghraib. They were taken to uh, Virginia, where they were put on trial. Um, and the trial, one of them, uh, Cody pleaded and 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 um, the other decided to go to trial. But that trial itself cost anywhere from 50 to 70 million dollars. What we did see was the best of American justice occurring, um, you know, and, and, and while things had been probably the worst of of, of of some of the engagement for early early on for Diane here we were seeing um you know the very best of American justice um uh, and it was an extraordinary thing but it's a grand irony when we think about it to think about 50 to 70 million dollars spent on a trial when that money could have been applied in other ways earlier and we know what the consequences could have been also just even the idea of negotiating is so important to these times when we be have become particularly diseased with certainty. People are not talking to each other, not just in in, in America, but but across but across the world. And uh, we, we're sort of refusing. Everyone says, you know, come into the room if you look like me, or come into the room if you sound like me, or come into the room if you vote like me. But what Diane was doing and has been doing, and and especially a, a, a parent when she went to see Cody, was she was saying. No, hold on a moment. We need to understand one another. One of the things that we must do is we must take that leap away from um, the, 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 the narrow channels of certainty and, and, and start to try to, uh, to understand one another. Because if we don't, we are, we, we, we're going to be doomed to repeat this over and over and over again. And that's why I'm in awe of what um, she has uh, managed to do and continues to do. And because the, the landscape is continuing to change um, in very, very dark times. Yeah, and Diane, just to be clear, and so Cody, who was this member of ISIS who was involved in the murder of your son, um, you know, there's a phrase, there's a phrase in French, um, uh, tu comprends et tu pardonnes, par meaning if you understand everything, you can forgive everything. But I don't think that you forgave Cody. Cody that was not the intention of your meeting with him. What, what, what was the intention? Well, the intention was to have some better understanding. Um, Jim would have wanted to meet him. There's no question in my mind that Jim would have not wanted me to be afraid and would have wanted me to hear him out and hear his perspective. Why did Cody and the others have such hatred for us that they really looked at all the American hostages as the epitome of evil, literally. And um, But by the same token, I wanted him to know who Jim was and that to point out to him that Jim and the others were non-combatants, you know? So I really feel the felt the exchange was very important. And um, I was very grateful. He um, expressed a lot of remorse. Um, and it was very sad. It was just very sad. That's what hatred begets. Everybody loses. Everybody suffers. And um, it was just very sad, Peter. Did you come away with any under additional understanding of this guy or... Oh, sure. I mean, you know, Alexander's this age of one of our sons. And it was just, I had really prayed for the grace to see him as a person. And I was able to, thanks to God's help and the fact that he was the same age as one of our sons. And he had made a horrific mistake and had zeroed in on this hatred for our crimes as, as a America. America has made mistakes. And it's those mistakes, particularly in the wake of 9-11, I feel, that engendered a lot of this hatred that continues in the world. And so he 
he wanted to share. So he shared a lot of why he he felt and acted as he did. Um, and some... I shared with him how we felt. So yeah. Uh, so uh, we have some audience questions coming in, and if you do have a question in the audience, use the Slido box. But let me let me start with the first one from anonymous. Did writing the book help the rest of the family understand your personal journey? Um, um, our family has been, everyone's been grieving in their own way. And um, I think our other sons and our daughter, and even my husband, it's taken them a while to understand why I felt the need to do the work through the Foley Foundation, but that's been healing to me. It truly has. Whereas for the rest of the family, they're more private. But yes, at this point in time, they were willing for the book to happen. Early on, they didn't want anything to do with the book. So I had to listen to the family, give them these years to come to terms with some of the horror of Jim's murder. But yes, the family's very much at peace with um, Jim's story and proud of um, his legacy. Um, another question from Anonymous, which is, what lessons from your experience can the families of those taken hostage on October 7th by Hamas learn? If there are lessons that are applicable. And also, you obviously deal with a lot of hostage families yourself, Diane. You have right. Well, I feel um, as Americans um, who are blessed with a free society that we need to advocate for our loved ones. You know, our, sometimes our government doesn't get it right or doesn't hear us. And I think that's what is amazing about our government, that we need to use our free speech, get um, need to talk to journalists and make our experience public in a sense so that people can come to understand. And that's part of the reason I'm so grateful to call him because he's helped this book to come out at a time when the threat is very much there. Continuing with Hamas, taking the Israeli hostages with Russia, continuing to target our citizens. China and Iran holding on to our people. This is not going away, Peter. And our nation needs to employ this um, hostage enterprise that we've developed and make it better and look at how we can collectively hold captors accountable and deter the practice internationally. Well, deterrence is a very interesting um, because um, obviously Two, two ISIS members who were involved in the murder of your son were held to account. But actually, that's pretty rare in my sort of... Very rare. Very rare. And that's why I was disappointed that our media here in the United States did not um, let the public realize how important that trial was. Yes, it was expensive, but the accountability was hugely important. And... During the trial, media from the UK and Europe was, you know, spent two weeks with us in Virginia. But to be honest, the US trial was missing. And that's what um, US media rather. And that's why I'm so grateful for you, Peter, because I think it's important as a nation that we recognize that we're learning as a country, that this is an important um, uh, issue for our country in terms of national security. Yeah, just down the road, there was the, the 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 Johnny Depp trial. I'm not saying the Johnny Depp trial wasn't important. Of course it was important and there were important things, but um, the, you know, the whole idea was that there was something, there was some celebrity going on there and, and but something deep was happening and, and the historical was happening in terms of um, our relationship to justice and and bringing these um, these two men to 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 justice and 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 doing so with them um, with a with a great amount of dignity um and watching the prosecutorial team uh, work was 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 quite extraordinary and it was a big story on the american landscape that uh, quite frankly a lot of the newspapers uh, just didn't they they, they they didn't see it uh, they went there on the first day and the last day 
but other uh, countries came in other the reporters from uh, journalists from other countries came in and um, told the story day after day after day and i think that's um important for us to recognize and we wanted to get that across um in the book um and the the the, the depth of of of, uh, of the engagement here yeah colin you're you're a novelist obviously that's your main uh and uh, a book I have always found very interesting uh, was written by a novelist about kidnapping, and it's a nonfiction book, which is News of a Kidnapping by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you ever have read it, Colin, but, uh, you know, because Marquez started life as a journalist, and right. this is really his only big nonfiction book. Right. Well, this is my first uh, nonfiction book uh, too, and um, you know, you look at somebody like uh, like Marquez and how he has influenced the 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 the, the landscape of how we think. Um, it brings up very a lot of very very interesting things for me personally about the tension between fiction and nonfiction. What's true and what's not true. You know, we're living in these times where where fake news is you know is, is the the phrase on 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 everybody's lips. And so, what's true and what's not true. You know, what is a fact and what is not a fact. Uh, you know, facts become sort of mercenary things that can be used and shipped off to whatever uh, sort of orphanage you want them to go to. Uh, but texture is a different thing. And 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 what I found in this in, in this story, uh, what that was watching Diane, we were talking about the ineffable things. We're talking about you know uh, love, and pride, and sacrifice, and violence, and compassion, and all of these things that have no specific facts that can be wrapped around them. Um, and it's almost as if the ineffable became the facts of um, human experience. And so for me as a novelist, watching this, I wanted to capture uh, both the, 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 the truth of what, what was going on, and um, also, but I wanted to be, people to be there in the pulse of the moment. Now, let's be honest, there were a couple of times Diane had to rein me in because <laughs> I'm a novelist, I make stuff up sometimes, uh, and 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 so we had to, uh, you know, we but we worked as a team, and I actually I, I'm so grateful for 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 the fact that we we did have that discipline uh, with one another. Um, so I would write something, and Dan you know, would would read it, and then we'd come back and say, okay, well, you know, this is the you know. Uh, a B C D E F, but you've forgotten the G H, you know, and and uh, it was a a fascinating experience. So as a writer, um, entering into the realm of uh, nonfiction, um, specifically nonfiction, was um, uh, important to me. Now the other thing is, it's a book about journalists, right, and a book about journalism. And Jim was a great journalist. What I liked about Jim was the sort of journalist that 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 I I actually started out as a journalist too, but the sort of journalist I would like to be. Um, you know, he would go to the marketplaces in Damascus and he would find the old man in the corner playing chess who had had a great story to tell. Or he would find the young girl, uh, you know, with a backpack full of um, books and, 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 and he would explore their stories. He wanted the, 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 the human um, and, and he went to the, the supposedly anonymous corners of human experience and found the real story there, as well as telling you know the general story because he was embedded as you know with the 101st uh, airborne and 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 he knew the lives of soldiers but everybody who talked about jim said he was really curious really curious and 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 always got to the heart of the story um so i think that was really important and then of course the foley foundation is working now with um with with with, with journalists in extraordinary ways to try and ensure their safety around the world we have a number of uh, stories coming, a number of questions coming in. One is from Bill Holstein. He said, how did Cody become so radicalized? You know, <clears throat> that is a good question. Um, I think uh, Alexander is not that, not unusual. I think when young men are brought up without a parent, um, his dad died when he was young, in, you know, I don't know if it was so much poverty, but certainly not plenty. And I I think, you know, also a foreigner in a different country. I mean, his he looked foreign, if you will. I think he struggled to fit in. And, and, and to, I, to clarify, Dan, he grew up in, in London, right? Yes, he did. He grew up in London. His mom was from Cyprus, I believe. And, um, you know, so... I think it was hard to fit in. And I, 
and I think when youngsters struggle to fit in or are bullied, I think that is when um, they need guidance in terms of, you know, and are particularly vulnerable to hatred and to ideology that can turn them um, in make them radicalized, if you will. So I think Cody was like a lot of youngsters who grew up in poverty and want, if you will. Um, and what's ironic is that Jim had really worked with a lot of youth like Alexander. He had uh, worked with felons in the Cook County Jail in Chicago, um, the inner city of Phoenix and Holyoke, Mass. So it, it was kind of ironic that this is the kind of youth that j the jihadists um, recruited, if you will. Yeah, he suggested to us, Peter, at one stage that, you know, he'd been sub subject to some some abuse. I mean, his father was from Ghana and, and, mm -hmm. and his mother was from abroad, too. He grew up in the Greek or Orthodox Church. And so he went down to 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 the, the mosque and he mm -hmm. found people who were like uh, using this inflamed rhetoric that spoke to him mm -hmm. and made him feel at home. Um, and you know, one of the first trips he made was he, he made a trip towards Gaza. He never actually uh, uh, got there, uh, but his um, you know his whole uh, ethos was what was 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 framed around uh, what was happening at the in 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 the local mosque. And like a lot of young men. Uh, he found some sort of meaning there, and the, that that meaning was perverted into into um, you know violence and violent engagement. Um, and I think you know he's sitting in prison now. He's there twenty three and a half hours of every day, in you know maximum security, thinking about these things. And um, you know um, I, I I I'm 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 quite sure uh, we met a, a a young man who had been portrayed as a football hooligan, a street thug, all that sort of thing. He wasn't that. He was much more thinking and 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 um and um. You know, he had a he had a depth that wasn't necessarily talked about um, uh, by others. Um, that's not to say he was a some sort of shining light. Uh, you know, there were times when he was trying to pull the wool over our eyes. When we were sitting there talking with him, he was trying desperately to pull the wool over our eyes. But I mean, as I said before, I think D Diane, of all the people I know in the world, uh, has this incredible emotional intelligence. Um, now she was able to talk to him. Uh, and 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 get him to talk to us. Um, uh, at the same time, she knew exactly uh, what was going on uh, underneath all of that all of that rhetoric, and that was fascinating too. And um, you know, I I do think um, it's important to note that you know we call the book American Mother. Uh, there was uh, there was a real female energy there that uh, that that Diane brought uh, that I think is in incredibly important. We find that. The readers, a lot of readers, uh, are, are 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 women who find Diane's story particularly important. Dan, as you know, March 9th is this new American hostage day, wrongful detainee day, uh, which uh, with a new hostage flag, and uh, that'll be this Saturday. So, um, what does that what does that all mean to you and to to other people that have had to deal with the problems you the, the situation you've been in? Isn't it, isn't it amazing, it's serendipitous that this book is coming out the week that finally our country um, recognizes the sacrifice of so many Americans who have died um, uh, and been targeted beca simply because they have a U.S. passport. So you're right, this Saturday, um, March 9th has been named as the day to remember current hostages and wrongful detainees. Um, we, we at the Foley Foundation count a minimum of 57 public cases. We have many in the gray zone, but it was uh, March 9th was chosen because it is the day Robert A. Levinson was kidnapped off of Iran and his family has worked tirelessly along with our family and so many others to help our government really understand the threat that this is and to prioritize the return of innocent U.S. nationals around the world. But many still are detained. Many are still held. And um, that's why it's such an urgent issue that I appreciate people hearing about.
And of course, if you're a journalist or an aid worker, you're not doing journalism and aid worker in a country, let's say, like Luxembourg. I mean, by definition, you're going to dangerous places. Not all the time, but I mean, um, you're going to be in Afghanistan, you're going to be in Iraq, you're going to be in Syria, um, you're going to be in places which are which are dangerous. Um, and that's just the nature of the business that um, however, now, when it comes to wrongfully detained Americans who are traveling, let's say to Iran or Russia or China, I think there's now a, a better effort by the government and perhaps a better understanding by the public that maybe you shouldn't go to St. Petersburg on vacation now if you're an American because you might well get picked up. Uh, I mean, and that that's really changed in Russia in the last, I don't know, I would say decade or so that it's a very different kind of situation. And particularly if you're a dual national. Definitely. Because a lot of these countries, they don't see you as an American, even if you've got an American passport. If you are, if you still have an Iranian passport, or you still have a Russian passport, or some, they see you, they, they feel that they can take you. Absolutely. And you're so right. And so in spite of the wonderful people working in the current U.S. hostage enterprise, the negotiation to actually free Americans um, from nation states like Russia or Iran, China, um, Syria is very difficult. I mean, this is not easy to do. Um, I have to commend the many people who've made many, uh, allowed many U.S. nationals to come home, but it is tough. So as Americans, we need to become more savvy, more aware, and more intentional about where we choose to travel internationally. But you're right, just like as firemen and policemen go into dangerous, their jobs are inherently dangerous. And the same is true of war correspondents, aid workers. They go where there is need, where there's news that would otherwise not reach us. So they provide a vital role in, in our democracy and in our world, and we need to have their backs. Another question, Dan, you mentioned earlier, you know, obviously the European hostages that were held by Hamas, um, almost, I mean, they all got out, there were quite a lot of them, um, the Spanish, the French, etc. Um, all the countries were reported to, you know, to have paid, paid ransoms, they may not have uh, publicly admitted, but they, they, they did. So are you advocating, uh, this is a question from the audience, are you advocating that um, you know, the United States should pay ransom or that com or American families be allowed to pay ransom if the government doesn't pay ransom? Or what, what are you advocating in that kind of situation? Uh, I am advocating that we negotiate, that we have to interact with the captors. To not interact is to abandon our citizens. And I do think there's a way to use ransom as lure. We, uh, the FBI has used that domestically very successfully for years. It's not easy, very, it's complicated to use it internationally, but I think it can be a way to actually identify and apprehend captors. Um, so I think we need flexibility. And I think we need to have the backs of the family who, want to, to find some way to free their loved ones. And so our current um, uh, strictness of our policy to me gets in the way of negotiation. I know several cases that have been prolonged because we didn't have the flexibility to work with families and, and use um, ransom as lure as a possible means of negotiation. And what was the number of uh, known cases you mentioned, Diane? Right now it's 56 public cases, but yeah. I receive <laughs> requests for help every day, every week. Um, yeah. We're covering more and more in a gray zone. Um, and, I, and I think that's important for people in the audience to understand is that there are plenty of cases that are not public for one reason or another. The family decides they don't want to go public or they've been told by the government it would endanger their loved ones if they did go public. And sometimes that's reasonable advice, and sometimes that's probably not very reasonable advice, depending on the situation. Uh, but there, uh, you know, it's hard to tell how many non-public cases are. But I, but you, there are clearly quite a quite a few beyond the fifty-six that you know of. There's hundreds every year, Peter. There yeah. truly are. 
there truly are. But that's in contrast to thousands of Americans who may have committed some true crime that gets a just just sentence, if you will. But we're talking about U.S. nationals who um, received, uh, you know, uh, who've been arrested or taken kidnapped simply because they're Americans, U.S. And nationals. I mean, the, I mean, the process to be declared wrongfully detained at the State Department is a process. It's, um, you know, it, it um, because as you, I mean, that tens of thousands of Americans get arrested around the world for, you know, because they, I don't know, got drunk in a bar and hit somebody or whatever they did. I mean, uh, and but, you know, the, the, the being declared wrongfully detained as Brittany Griner was, the basketball player for she was arrested with a tiny amount of medically prescribed mar uh, marijuana, cannabis, um, that tool i mean a it's not it's not automatic that that you know, it's a process but then that does allow the state department to say open negotiations for in Brittany griner's case they wanted a russian arms deal and then victor boot back and that was the exchange i mean no one there's always going to be an exchange i mean um, they're going back to this question of the negotiation i mean if somebody takes somebody else they're not going to just wake up one day saying I'm having a good day. I'm just going to let this person go. Something has got to be exchanged. Some kind of value, whether it's money or in some cases or a prisoner exchange or something. Well, yes and no, Peter. Um, it's remarkable. We've seen some people let go just because of kind of a better understanding of the captor, um, you yeah. know. Um, so it is there, you know, obviously exchanges just happen. Sometimes that's the only way. But I advocate dialogue, getting to know the captor. Why did they take this person? What can we do to shrewdly um, figure out a way to help them to see the benefit of letting them go? That isn't always the case, but there are many times when that's happened that way. So it, it gets down to negotiation. And, and the process for wrongful detention still is very difficult, Peter. Um, it's not easy because captors often want to plant evidence or the alleged crimes they want to. Um, so it's not easy to ascertain the truth, to be honest. It's, it's very difficult. U.S. Consular and the Special Envoy Office work on this daily. But it's very hard for families because the process is often opaque. So uh, the Foley Foundation, you know, is working hard with our government to try to make it um, as fair as possible. Um, sometimes it seems like if you're more of a celebrity or better known, the process is much quicker than it is if you're an unknown, um, situations like that. So the Foley Foundation works on trying to make it as equitable and as transparent as possible, but we still have a ways to go, Peter. It's not an easy process by any means. But you have, you and the Foley Foundation and, and other families have changed the policy in a way that before there was really no one to call, or if you did call somebody, they didn't really, they would just pass you on to somebody else. I mean, there wasn't somebody who was really responsible for this at the in the FBI or the State Department, and now there is that. And I think another important detail here is that families get access to classified information that they otherwise would not have received, so they can get better sense of what it, the government knows uh, about their loved one. In the past, they would have received very little information. I think when when Jim was taken, you didn't get much information at all, right? Nothing, nothing. But we still have a ways to go, Peter. If you talk to some of the families, I mean, it's it's hard. Change, it happens slowly. But I'm so grateful for the um, folks working on the hostage enterprise. I'm grateful for the leadership, President Biden and President Trump. They both prioritize the return of U.S. nationals. And I just pray that it can stay a nonpartisan issue that we have the backs of um, other U.S. nationals in this situation. I have some more questions coming in. Um, so from Noel Co Koch, um, is there any current information on the status of Austin Tice, who's an American journalist, former uh, veteran who, was, who disappeared in Syria? So is there... 
Well, I'm not really at liberty um, to um, say, but I know the family feels he's very much alive. And we're, we're talking about a relentless um, captor who, you know, in President Assad, who doesn't even acknowledge that he is holding U.S. nationals, when in fact we know he is. We know as a country he is. But he's an example of someone incredibly difficult to figure out how to negotiate with. Um, so I know the family is doing everything they possibly can. And we pray that Austin can survive this horrific ordeal. But it's these are the cases. Okay, I mean, Austin's, we have Mark Sweet Ann in China, more than 12 long years held in China. We have many people um, held for long. We have a, a person held in the UAE more than 15 years now, um, Zach Shahid. So it's these are cases that are hugely problematic that our um, countries is working on. And we as a foundation continually advocate for attention for these complicated cases. From Anonymous, um, what's been the response to the book from the people who've read it is what's been the most surprising response? Well, um, it's actually gone uh, very well. So we published it first in France um, and uh, it went straight into the uh, bestseller list, which was very gratifying. The same happened in, in Ireland. I have found that it's um, uh, particularly uh, touched um, uh, women readers. Um, you know, my sister, who uh, she, 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 she's a good reader, strong reader, but she's read this book now four times over. Uh, she got a chance to meet uh, um, Diane in, in Dublin. Um, she's amazed by the power uh, of the, the, you know, the, the, the human part of the story. Um, you know the the uh, how somebody can 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 continue to uh, have the strength to do this sort of thing. I think also people um, who are, are touched by the um, the faith that, that that is on display. I think it's a very important thing to 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 to, to talk about. Um, I think you know I saw Diane's faith in extraordinary ways. Um, just even in that very first day when we when we met with uh, with 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 Cody, and there was a sense that um, and and Diane will speak to this better than than, than I could, but that there was a sense that that um, you know the Holy Spirit was coming along, and saying you know um you you know you can be guided in certain ways. For me personally, I often felt I got close to Jim. I got very close to Jim. I never met him, but I had that photograph where, uh, you know, he was reading "Let the Great World Spin." Uh, and I've become closer and closer to him um, as, as as time goes along. And sometimes I feel like he's, you know, he's sitting right here on my shoulder, having a word with me, saying, "Make make sure you look after Diane now, and uh, you know, make sure that this story gets out into the world because he would be proud of the fact um, that um, his mom has told this story and with such courage, and also, uh, you know, done it with such dignity as well. So that was been uh, one of the things about how the book has been uh, been received is we're we're um over here we're using um, a, a small non-profit uh, publisher etruscan i think that's important and uh, part of the proceeds will go towards the the foley foundation and so um the more people who can you know spread the word about this book um the better off uh, we're, we're all going to be i've been well, surprised oh go ahead no go yeah, ahead I was calling, are, you, are you catholic colin yeah, I was I was raised Catholic. Let's put it like that. You know, my 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 father would make the, the 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 this that he would say that you were, I wasn't just a lapsed Catholic, but when I was a teenager, I became a collapsed Catholic. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I and actually I have to say that my faith has 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 deepened um over the course of um, the time working on 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 this particular story. Also, uh, watching um, Diane and the way that she uh, operates. Um, I have a deeply human instinct towards story storytelling and 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 uh, looking at others. Um, but um, I, I think there is a a strong faith element to this book that um, that still surprises me, to be honest with you. I'm I'm surprised by the um interest in Europe. I, I just, I was overwhelmed by the interest and it just speaks to our need to work 
together as Western nations to me. They, you know, the folks in France and the UK and Ireland, all very, and Amsterdam actually, very interested in our story and looking to our country to lead the way in some ways and learn from them and others as to how to navigate the complexity of this issue. So I'm I'm really gratified by people's openness of mind and the need to really understand the threat um, that's out there and the need to build bridges between countries. I mean, if we allow this hatred to continue, we've got to find ways to understand each other or at least be willing to listen to one another. We really do, Peter. And also then the, the power of the ordinary individual outside the parameters of of, of actual um, you know political power. Um, I think people are touched by that 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 notion that 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 one person uh, you know can galvanize other people to to affect a, a, a sort of extraordinary national change. Um, and I think people are, are are buoyed by that that there's still the power of the individual to um, to to influence debate and talk on on a national stage. And I, I really think, you know, Jim aspired to be a man of moral courage, Peter. He did. He mm -hmm. aspired to that. And I, I really think that's the challenge he gives us. You know, he challenges all of us to care about our freedom and be people who dare to try to do good in the world, to try to make a difference. Do you think this is a question from Bob Clam, sir? Uh, Diane, do you feel that the arrest and prosecution of the two ISIS members, is that a deterrent or what? what is that? Oh, I definitely think it's a deterrent. I, I definitely think um, we must find ways to hold captors accountable. It's, it's yeah. we've got to make it hurt to take people and use them as political pawns. And that's the, that's the challenge we face. We've got to do all we possibly can. It's it's horrific. They, they're human rights crimes, you know. It's awful what Jeffrey endured all those years, you know. It's horrific. And you sort of touched on this in a question from Anonymous. Um, to what extent is there hope for a greater international collaboration on hostage issues? Obviously, Hamas has kidnapped Many of them are, I mean, most of them are Israelis, but six of them are Americans, four Americans have been released. And I imagine there are probably other dual nationals. Uh, we know what they definitely were. There were Thai citizens who were released relatively early on. But um, do countries kind of just sort of do it on their own or do countries cooperate or how do you, how do you? Well, that's the sadness. I mean, Jim was taken with all our allies, if you will, and every single country sought to do it alone. And it, it it's all the failure is obvious, you know. So I I really got to commend the UN and um, Canada for their declaration against arbitrary detention, and we must um, work on this together because it it we really are stronger together. We've got to find ways to counter this trend because. Um, here we thought it, when our Bringing Americans Home report came out in September of 2023 that we were able to report that incidences of terrorists taking hostages had declined. Well, Hamas proved that wrong the month next month. So, I mean, I'm afraid this is a continuing threat that we've got to recognize and um, be shrewd about how we get, we're going to deal with it. In the remaining three minutes we have, uh, Colm, any final thoughts? Diane, any final thoughts? Well, I, I, I just got to say that I'm grateful that uh, people are engaged in this. This is our, 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 our U.S. publication day. Um, I'm very happy to have been involved in this. Um, you know, I was actually writing a novel uh, when um, the story came along and, and, and it took a, a, a year out of my uh, out of my novel and now I'm going to go back to my novel but it's been one of the one of the great uh, moments of my literary life to 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 be engaged in a story like this and I'm really galvanized now by the 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 sense that that something's going to happen over here um yeah we could see it in Ireland and yes we could see it in France and in England uh, but I'm really hopeful that people will spread the word over here Exactly. And thank you, Peter, yeah. for your time and all of your listeners, because please spread the word. 
and share the little book. It's a it's a quick read, beautifully written by Colm. And I I just would encourage you to help us share the message so that we can be safe and meet the challenges we are facing. Thank you so much, Peter. Well, thank you very much, Diane. Thank you for uh, Colm. Good luck. Uh, if, if an appropriate day for us to be talking uh, your U.S. publication day. If anybody wants to buy the book, they can do uh, with the purchase uh, button on the screen. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you both for talking with us. Thank you.